Character building is hard for me. But now there are tools to help out, so we're going to talk about it today on I Should Be Writing Season 18, Episode 13. But I should be writing. I should be working on my So hi there, welcome to I Should Be Writing. It's a podcast for wannabe genre authors. Yes, I'm changing that up, putting a little caveat in there. Even though I'm pretty sure that the PR people who constantly contact me about their clients and they're convinced that they're perfect for my show without actually looking at what I feature won't hear it, but still. This is a genre show. I talk about science fiction, fantasy, horror, uh, romance sometimes, just all the genres. I like the genres. Anyway, this genre show has been going on since 2005, and now it is live Tuesdays and Thursdays on Twitch at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That is twitch.tv slash mightymer. Later it goes into the podcast feed. Last Thursday should be going up in today's podcast feed shortly. Um, my name is Mer Lafferty, and I'm a Hugo and Nebula nominated author, and I still feel like I've got a lot to learn. You can find my books pretty much anywhere that are sold in North America, and some internationally, except for my most popular and award nominated book. The Brits didn't want that one. As for what I've been working on, I've got kind of good news and bad news. Not bad news for anybody else but me. Um, I haven't written a lot of words in the past two days. Yesterday, I decided I was going to eat dessert first and work on um, my new shiny idea that I got this weekend. And then I learned why you're not supposed to eat dessert first. And why we keep dessert as a treat instead of a appetizer. So uh, I wrote a lot yesterday, I just didn't write on the correct project. And um, then today I decided to buckle down and do some outlining work. She's a wretched human who's very dangerous and harmful to some people that I quite like, but uh, I do have an outline that that lady in Scotland made, and um, it was it's pretty brilliant. It's a it's like a well, it, it, it probably would be better done in, in, in a spreadsheet, but she had a piece of paper with a grid on it, and so across the top is like, plot. This was for Order of the Phoenix, so it's, what is the Order of the Phoenix doing in this chapter? What's ha what's happening with the romance in this chapter? Um, and the different major things going on, where what's happening with them in every single chapter. And, um, I thought that was great. So I tried to do it. And I got about five chapters in and I, that's when I realized I was out of order, but that's okay. I don't mind writing out of order because I had, had a major reveal. I didn't realize it until later, but I had a major reveal in, um, the thing I wrote today, the little bit I wrote today and thought, wait a minute, that's gotta be later. That, that can't be now. This is supposed to be something that that opens everyone's eyes to what's going on, not just a, a casual thing said in a bar by a large sentient rock bartender. Yeah, valuable lesson that Twitter sometimes need to remember. Mean people can be talented. Yes, that's true. There are still things to learn. Uh, just not from anything she says in person, in the real world. You know, <laughs> if you would like to avoid those, I, you know, there, there are plenty of other authors who have outlines out there, but this was one I found, and I found it tucked into a book on character. And that's what we're going to talk about today, because I... It's, it's that duck swimming thing, like, 
I complain about how hard writing characters are and then people compliment my characters and I'm like, well, that's <laughs> that's the final draft of something I worked really, really hard on. It's a challenge for me to write good characters. They almost all start out boring and passive and interesting things happen around them and they're like, oh, I guess I better go over there. That block's going to fall on me. And then I have to, you know, spice them up. As for good news, I don't think I have any personally. I have one an email that I neglected. It was sent a while back, and I apologize. I'm going to look that one up while um, anybody in chat wants to tell me what their good news is. And if you have, uh, if you have good news after we record this and you want to share it with me, email me, put good news in the subject line, and I will put it on the podcast, and then we will all cheer with the yay button. All right, good news from Ben. I'm going to dilute this. It's it's kind of long. Um, after a decade plus of listening to your podcast, my ad- my advance from St. Martin's Press just came through for my first book, which is a history of D&D, which sounds awesome. And then he says a lot of nice things about me and the podcast, which are very sweet, so... The book is called Slaying the Dragon. It's about how the company that made D&D in the 90s, TSR, ran itself into the ground and was purchased by Wizards of the Coast. Hundreds of hours of interviews and even had long buried documents sent to me from anonymous sources. That sounds awesome. So I'm getting a review copy of this. I'm very excited about this. So congratulations, Ben. We are very excited for you and your new book. Yay button for you. Oh man, I gotta clean this out. I've got like stuff from the Fonda Lee thing here. Okay, yeah. That's it for email. I don't have any good news except I have no news, and sometimes that's the best news there is. Um, going to chat. Oh, ran into the problematic thing with metal bands. It really sucks when there's a band with great music but very, very problematic opinions. Yeah, I. There was a guy who played basketball for UNC that I was a big fan of when I was in high school. And I think I searched for him one day and he was out doing a racist on the internet or doing a sexist or a homophobia. I can't remember what it was, but it was, it was sad. It was heartbreaking. (laughs) Okay, Kimmy, I'm sorry. One of my favorite quotes is from that woman's seventh book. Sucks that I have to share it with a caveat now, though. They're good books. They are. Except, you know, they're really riddled with adverbs, which shows you. It's like those books in The Da Vinci Code and Twilight, they all show you that if you can tap into whatever vein people need, my metaphor's falling apart, but if you can tell a story that a lot of people won't, they don't care how badly you write. And the, the, the adverbs, I, I listen to most of those books and the adverbs just really stand out in audio. I don't know why. Maybe I, maybe you just start to like gloss over them once you've read too many when you're reading. But let's, we got some rejections to celebrate. Underpope got one. Star Eye Green got two. Awesome. Well done, folks. I'm getting the A button figured out. I really am. And we'll do this slowly. Hopefully this will work. There's one. That's 36. 37. 38! Awesome! 38 rejections. You guys are great. What was the name of the D&D book again? I think it was just the history of D&D. Let me look it up. Oh, Slaying the Dragon by Ben Riggs. All right, let's get to the thing. I have said that um, I'm not that I'm not good with characters, but I realize people have been putting out kits and tools and kind of fun things for a while now. And I'm very, very sorry in the fact that um, the guy who created Better Backstories sent it to me 
a while ago. I don't even want to know how long. I don't even want to try to think how long because it's probably much worse than my estimation. So I apologize, but I've been looking at the cards and they're pretty clever. So, um, it's got, let's see. Each card has a number of things on it. Let's see if I can get this on. I want the description card of what everything is. Damn it. I prepared for this. I really did. I went to go get everything. At least I got that going for me. Okay, here's the category icons. So on each one of these cards has some information. Here's the back of the card. I can't really see it. You can see like the four and there's an equal sign up here, up here, and more iconography on the bottom. Um, there's a cloud on the bottom. So it's got category icons of life, mystery, change, drive, trouble, mystical, Benefit and technical. And then, so each, this one, this card says modern. And you're always focused on progress. Bigger, better, stronger, faster is the way to go. So you get, this is if you want to give somebody a character uh, thing. This is better backstories. So we're trying to build up characters, whether they're for RPGs or fiction or whatever. But I think... The really clever thing about this this pack is if you're not if if this doesn't apply if the written part doesn't apply to you, you can still use this card because it also has uh, locations, weather, a variety of things. So you know if you say I want I need I need something about my character's backstory. Well, I got worldly. You had a widely traveled friend or family member who told you all manners of stories. Through them, you've learned about details about a culture. And if I don't like that, I've also drawn heavy rain or lake. And then there's the question mark. I don't know what the question mark means. There's more iconography in here. So this is actually pretty cool. Um, you've also got... Here's a timing card. The point of this is you were born at a strange time, which, you know, fits for a lot of fantasy stuff. People like to know when you were born. You know, I guess you roll a d10, because you've got sunrise or sunset, new or full moon, blue moon, solar or lunar eclipse, midnight or noon, rainbow, New Year's Day. Rainbow's not a time. Anyway, astronomical conjunction, premature, same day as a relative. And if you don't like that, you've got Chicago on here, Windy City. This is Better Backstories. And they sent me this, and I did not look at it for a very long time, and I apologize, because I really do think if you play RPGs or have problems with characters like I do, you could benefit from this. And even if it's something like... I'm a strong believer in... I kind of call it a diving board off of something. Like, if somebody gives me some advice... It's possible that that advice will trigger an idea that's completely unrelated, but their advice got me there. And so that's why I kind of see it as a springboard. It's like, I'm not, I'm not using what you said, but you got me to where I couldn't have gotten before. And I think these cards can do that as well. Um... Oh, probably there's a rainbow over the house you were born in. Okay, that's interesting. A tree lobster, so characters don't just appear fully formed in people's heads and haunt their dreams until they write them down. Tries not to look weird, fails. No tree lobsters. I'm really glad you said that because I think a lot of writers have that. I've had people who've told me their characters by name won't leave them alone. And I've act actually felt jealous because I don't have that at all. At all. I don't have any characters in my head talking to me telling me about their story. Like I said, when they hit the first... In Rough Draft, when they hit the page, it's... They're kind of bland. Which is why I believe in more 
uh, stuff. So this is book two of a series. A lot of my characters are already developed, but I'm bringing in a new... I mean, someone new has come to this space station, and um, I kind of threw him in at the last minute as an aside, and he's becoming a much bigger character. And so I have to flesh him out. And I'm thinking, he's he, he's, he's a skeleton right now. He, he's got nothing. So my plan was I was going to go into better backstories and figure that out with him. So Tree Lobsters, you are not weird. I've heard many people say that what you ha what you have is, is the norm. Or I I've heard enough people say that that kind of thing is the norm. Not me not hearing something. Nathan Lowell, he he was a trained typist from the 70s. Like he, I remember I interviewed him a million years ago and was talking to him about his prolific output. The dude can write a book in a, in a weekend. He can write 10,000, 20,000 words a day. He was classic, you know, I don't even know if they teach typing anymore because we're all kind of self-taught at this point. I mean, I'm a writer and I was self-taught and my two friends who didn't want to be writers both took typing in high school. I don't know. But, um, where was I go? Oh, Nathan Lowell, right. He said that he learned how to type um, and then he joined like a typing pool, you know, the, the, the typically full of women. He, he got a job there with them and just became a really good typist. And he sees his book as a movie in his head and he has to write so fast just to keep up. It's very interesting how different people approach writing or how ideas come to different people. Um, checking on chat. They slowly tell me things like we're talking around a campfire. Interesting shards. I wish this happened for me. I worked in customer service for years and felt like I've gained some decent skills with reading people, but creating a new one is a slower process for me. Yeah, my problem is there have been times I've had conversations, and they've been conversations that have either been someone manipulative or trying to catfish or very clearly we were not on the same page and I was wondering if the other person was drunk or high or just trying to mess with me. And I get away from that conversation and think, could I ever write somebody like that? There was a woman who, like, she had a master's degree in, I don't know if it was negging or, this was, you know, many, many years ago. It's, if it was negging or casual put-downs or something, but we went out, in theory, to you know, go out together at night and I went home and burst into tears. And I almost couldn't tell you what she had done to make me do it. Because any one comment from her was fine. But none of them were so blatantly terrible. And once I calmed down, I realized, I'm like, could I write somebody like that? I don't think so. Um, what's negging? Good question, Shards. Negging is, uh, that's a pretty dress. It would look better if you were thinner. Is the, uh, compliment and put down in the same statement. It is a pickup artist tool. Yeah, that's negging. Um, so I'm gonna, I, I wanted to make a character, so I, I promised you I would, so we'll try to talk about the other things and then make a character, and then I will end the podcast for the podcast listeners and keep up with the bar con for the folks in the chat. If you would like to participate in our bar con where we relax a little bit, talk about anything, come hang out on twitch.tv slash mighty mirth, 3 p.m. Tuesdays and Thursdays, or if you want to, want to listen to the bar con, support at patreon.com slash mighty and you'll get all of this unedited. Possibly even my swearing that Summer has to cut out. So now we have Rory's Story Cubes. Ah! I'll never get that uh, mirror thing going with the 
with the video. I'll figure it out. I always wonder how the weather people do it. Because, you know, to them, they're like, oh, weather's happening here. And, you know, they they only see the green screen. They're magic. I wonder if there's like a, a class in meteorology school to point... Well, sure, they have monitors on the side. I can see myself right here, but I keep, I always go to the wrong side when I want to point at something. Um, so yeah, the story cubes. Party gamer, icebreaker, problem solving, creative inspiration, speaking and learning skills, mental workout, literacy development. So it's got a lot of different things. Um, how to play is roll all nine cubes and look at the face-up images. Pick an image that will be a starting point for your story. Um, once upon a time... We got a fountain here, so uh, think up a title or theme for the story, then roll all nine cubes to tell the story that relates back to that title or theme. Oh, these are suggested ways. This is not do it in order. Um, divide the cubes evenly among the players. Start with one player and continue in a circle. Take turns rolling the cubes and adding to the story. Um, so yeah, these are, so I'm not going to read every single side because these are six-sided dice and there are nine of them and I have things to do. <laughs> There's a sad face and a key and an eyeball and a fish and the earth. There's a smiley face. There's the, the classic clue, the the clue, clue token from uh, Arkham Horror. Or I suppose clue. Clue didn't have clue tokens. Arkham Horror has clue tokens. Um, so yeah, these are, I think these are a little bit more abstract than the Better Backstories book. You might think in that better. You maybe may not want to see, figure out how to incorporate an impact. An otherworldly event has touched your life. Maybe that doesn't work. Maybe you want to roll, that was really loud, and have a parachuter. So, um, that's how to use the cubes. Much, it's more vague, more broad and uh, more opportunities to do stuff. And then we've got, um, of course I took it out of the box and left the box in the other room. I think, oh no, there it is, uh, writer's emergency kit. Yeah, I bought this when it came out and then a friend of mine gave me one, so now I have two. Um, so these are, I, Let's just say it right. When your story gets stuck, Writer Emergency Pack has the tools you need. Fix plot holes, spice up stock characters, rethink your themes. The Writer's Emergency Pack gives you the questions that lead to great answers. This pack contains 26 illustrated idea cards, 26 detail cards with helpful suggestions and specific tips to try, instructions for individual and class use, plus a bonus story game, Cards Against Normality. So, um... Oh, there's a digital app for the story cube? That's interesting. Well, if 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 it's based on the story cubes, it's Rory's story cubes. Um so the writer's um emergency pack. I've got let let we'll start with my guy. I know what he looks like. Um I know he's laid back, but that could easily slide into boring, which I don't want to do. So, um, I really don't know much about him. I just know why he's on the space station. So, I'm going to draw a card. These are all... Okay, so these, these illustrated idea cards... Mm, can't. I can't see it, sorry. Uh, things like switch genres. Consider how your story might play out if it were in a completely different genre. What the hell is that? Oh! Okay. It's a horse in a bear skin. Next to a crushed beer can. So this is the imposter card. I really hope you guys can see this. So, focus. Block my face. Now focus on the card. Alright, it's not going to do it, but it's the imposter card, and there we go. I don't know about you guys, but 
It looks to me like an owl is sticking its face 45 degrees to the ground. And then I realize that's a horse's nose. But it was kind of upsetting when I first saw it and thought it was an owl. Because I did not understand where the legs came from. <laughs> Anyway, that's the imposter card. So, I'm going to go for um, Secret Society. I drew the Secret Society card. Secret Societies aren't just for thrillers. From Alcoholics Anonymous to Girl Scouts. Wow. Every group has goals, rituals, inside knowledge. Is your hero trying to get in or get out? Whether it's an ancient fraternity, a midnight bowling league, or the house down the street with the strange noises, secret societies provide your hero with a chance to enter a hidden world or escape a night nightmare. I love this. I really do love this. Because I had not thought of the Girl Scouts or Alcoholics Anonymous um, as, as a secret club. Girl Scouts, not so much, but Alcoholics Anonymous are supposed to be anonymous, which Paula Poundstone has some, um, she's, she's got some beef with, because she very publicly had to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. So, um, yeah, I keep thinking, sorry, going off on a Paula Poundstone tangent, she had a, uh, she was on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me one time, and they were talking about something that happened at a courtroom, someone selling sandwiches or something, and they're like, does that really happen? Do people, like, walk around and sell sandwiches in a courtroom? And there's no way I could ever re reproduce what she did, because she is the professional comedian, and I am not. But she just said yes in this, like, blunt, I know everything about it. And you know why I know everything about it. But I can tell you all about what happens in the courtroom, including about the sandwiches. And, um, yeah, that was very, very amusing. It's really hard to tell because I can't be Paula Poundstone and it's like I can't reproduce the timing and the how she said it. But, yeah, she, she had some issues with her. I don't even think they ever said what happened, but... She was a guardian to some kids and had some alcohol incidents. I don't know what they were. So she was arrested and, and had to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. And and now she can do stand-up about the trial and Alcoholics Anonymous, which she does. <laughs> Everything is grist for the mill, folks. If you're having a really bad day, think about that. No, I, I'm pretty sure that imposter was a horse in a wolf in wolf clothing. That was a horse. Yeah, sheep sheep don't have faces like that. But it does look like sheep. I don't know. I don't know what this is, because it really does look like sheep feet. But that's a horse face. I've got to stop looking at this. It's gonna really bother me. I think you know horses and sheep. Do you know poorly drawn illustrations? I know you know horses. But I... That, that, that nose was not a sheep's nose. All right, so... Um, so these are, these are pretty good. We got the Every Blessing is a Curse. From Monkey Paws to Pet cemeteries. fables have taught us that gifts rarely come without a price, but this needn't play as a supernatural moral lesson. Almost any improvement in the hero's life can backfire. Look for ways to turn a character's achievements against him. The new love interest can become a stalker. The new house can become a death trap. The new job can literally be murder. So, um... So, yeah, I think... I think I'm gonna try to beef up my character using some of these. I'm not quite sure how to use all of them, but I guess I should think about his backstory. Um, my first book, this isn't a big spoiler, is a story about people who, um, about a woman around whom murders happen. You've seen it in Murder, She Wrote, Father Brown, um, Miss Fisher Mysteries, uh, just 
death happens around these people and they're usually folksy or charming or some very charismatic and gregarious and stuff and they solve the murder and usually upset the local con local cops and um you know rinse and repeat and they've got a motley crew of of uh helpers the um the cab drivers and miss fisher were my favorite but um in it, i just kept thinking in real life no one would want to be around you nobody so i that's that's where my thought came from so we've got this woman whose murders happen around her so she leaves earth the second book i've got someone who's just always seems to be around when bad things happen not not murders and he doesn't solve anything so is he lucky because he doesn't die in any of this is he unlucky because this stuff keeps happening around him or what so this is the character i've chosen to cover but i don't know much about him I've decided he has a medical background, but that could mean anything from, like, certified nursing assistant to EMT to full-fledged doctor. Um, but I just drew the card that says, Wealthy, your family comes from above average means. They might even be nobles. You might have been born into privilege. That's not how you spell privilege. Okay. Or you were there while your family improved their station. So, and, and the iconography on here also mentions the weather of thunder and the location of hills. So we have, um, my unlucky slash lucky guy, wealthy, born into good means. I'll choose another one and we'll get the chat involved to see how, what you guys think we should do. Or if you're on board with wealthy, you need to tell me, uh, is this new money or old money? Is it work hard money or cheat all the poor people out of and, and be a slumlord kind of money? Glitch. Technology always seems to malfunction around you. From the scissors, from scissors to mainframes, the darn things just don't work right. This actually fits his character. There's also mudslide and grassland on here. So, um, that fits him pretty well. What are your thoughts on his, where his family's wealth comes from? I am curious. If you guys don't answer, I'll just roll a story cube and I might pull up a fish. And then I'll have to figure out how to choose his wealthy lifestyle from the fish and it'll be your fault. There is a sheep here, though, Fire Rider, just for you. Is there also a horse? There's a foot. Now I gotta find the horse. Damn it. Sounds like he's a doctor to me. Hey, Liptropod. Okay. Oh, this hurts my head. There's a die with a die on it. It's dice all the way down. Doctor has interesting backstory implications for sure. Fish equals black market illegal fish sales. Is that how you build wealth, though? Like, dynasty, generational wealth. Because I'm not sure. A doctor in a sci-fi novel that has trouble with tech, though? Yeah, you wouldn't want him to be working on anybody. You know, when um, my mother was doing the I want you to grow up and be a doctor and be successful and stuff, she also told me I should be a dermatologist because they never have emergencies. <laughs> because anytime something bad happens to the skin, you know, the burn unit's on it, or the surgeon's on it, or... Yeah. No, no emergencies in dermatology. Something not a medical doctor. That's why I liked the EMT. Um, he shows up in time to administer an EpiPen. That's the first we see of him. And that's where I learned that... Right, the EpiPens have trademarked the phrase... Great, now I can't remember which one. One side is orange and one side is green. 
So it's like orange to the sky, green to the thigh, or the other way around. And that's why you like hold it up and then you jam it down in the thigh. Um, sorry, fire writer, I shouldn't be talking about needles. But um, anyway, I just found it funny that they trademarked that, that kind of bad rhyme. Um, okay, so we've got a wealthy... Could could be legacy doctors, you know, the doctors that, that either their kids want to follow in their footsteps or feel incredibly pressured to follow in their footsteps. Actually, what's funny is I was reading up about EpiPens because of that scene, and they're, they're very well designed for pretty much anybody to use because they're, the pen is inside. I mean, not the pen, the, um, the needle's inside, and it doesn't come out until you get, like, three seconds of pressure. So you jam it against the thigh and hold it and a couple seconds pass and then the needle comes out and does its thing and then it retracts so nobody can get stuck and nobody can get bloodborne illnesses if you're helping somebody else out and accidentally get pick, pricked yourself all that stuff i did get a regular shot of epinephrine once that was not fun okay so i really do want to finish this story thing so we've got our wealthy guy who's not really good around technology but that's also because of He's just kind of unlucky. So we're going to go into the um, into the writer's emergency kit. And I pulled out secret societies again. So um, I think I'm going to put them in a secret society. Should we go for something cliche and powerful like the skull and bones? Or should we go into absolutely unexpected like the local model building club in the local hobby shop that once you get in you learn more about their nefarious deeds what's your thoughts on secret societies national weather service skunk works or black ops something old-fashioned so he has an excuse to avoid technology that's interesting dice a lily you know, National Weather Service could be something old-fashioned. I always loved that guy who, I think he lived for hurricanes, because back when we had cable, it's like, I'm on the eastern seaboard, we, we care a lot about hurricanes, so he was this old guy with a white mustache, and they'd, they'd bring him out every hurricane season, and he'd talk about the hurricanes, and then, you know, around November, he'd go back into his storage container or something, and then... Come June, they bring them back out and start talking about hurricanes again. And Union organizer, secret Luddites of the galaxy. <laughs> um, I'm getting into the weather thing. I like the weather, the, the secret weather club. But not the meteorological devices, because surely there are hobby meteorologists out there, right? Like, just, like, hobby astronomers or something okay so we're gonna go back to story cubes and um silly secret societies are awesome storm chasers of course thank you kids are asleep man so i don't know if i'm gonna use this or not because this is something that will need to be a mystery in the book and uncovered at a proper time. But I want to know what his secret is because everybody in a murder mystery has like secrets and motives. Well, he doesn't live in space. He's coming there from earth. This is like a, a, a shuttle of interesting people have arrived and our hero has to talk to humans again and hope none of them die. Hint. They're gonna die. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna roll this die and see how uh, what his secret could be. I got a damn magnifying glass. His secret is secret. He's the guy who took down forty of SpaceX 46, 49 Starlink satellites recently by mistake. <gasps> Did that happen? I know about the security guard who drew eyes on a million dollar painting because he was bored. That's true. Solar storm. Wow. 
kind of puts whatever mistakes you made in the past year kind of uh, on the small potatoes category. All right, I'm rolling another die because I did not appreciate getting a clue for the secret. Okay. We got we got the, the parachuting guy or gal again. So how does one rope a parachute into a backstory? We've already got him in a secret society and a doctor. Have there been many people parachuting for wars? I don't think that really happens much anymore. Oh, you're talking golden... Oh, K. Kimmy says golden parachute. You mean like, uh, uh, that's the... Okay, Mr. CEO, you sexually harassed a whole bunch of people and we're going to slap you on the wrist and kick you out and give you a million dollars on your way out kind of thing. If the secret is secret to him, uncovering it could be the plot of a subplot. Well, it, it also could have something to do with somebody in his past. Cool, cool, cool. We're going to talk about this a little bit more in the bar con, but I'm going to go ahead and end the episode right now. Oh, Lord, we've got, been going a while. Sorry. Uh, anyway, the, the, the tools are Rory's Story Cubes, which I also hear there's an app for. We've got Better Backstories, which is a very thick deck of cards that um, I, think, I think is great. I'm going to be using these. Uh, more when we're not recording. And we have the Writer's Emergency Pack, which um, it feels like it would be really specific, but as there's a lot of content on here, like the Secret Society is making me think of like Girl Scouts and Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, you know, the the card is just Secret Society, but it, it the, the, the text really helps you expand your view of what these things are to make your story more interesting. But if you want to get in touch with me, I am at mightymur at gmail.com. But if you want an interview, and thank you to the one person who proved that they actually do listen to the show. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My assistant will be in touch. If you would like to be on the show and you're a genre writer, even bonus of your debut in the past three years, um, even bonus if you're from a marginalized uh, group that doesn't usually get interviews, have your publicist, or you contact my assistant, Lafferty.assistant at gmail.com. You can see all my books and podcasts and stuff at merverse.com, and I am not ashamed to say that Hugo nomination season is here. Um, I'm eligible for FanCast. Ah, where did they, where did the words go? FanCast, Best Editor Short Form, along with SB Divya, and Best semi prosine for Escape Pod. And that's what I have to say. So, see you next Tuesday, and until then, you should be writing. I Should Be Writing is available to you under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. Theme music by John Anilio. Art by Numbers Ninja. Production by Summer Brooks. And hosting by Libsyn. Find all of this information and more at merverse.com. And remember, we can't do this without you. Thanks for your support. Well, I should be writing. I should be working on my craft. I should be writing. I should be submitting my next draft. But I'm sitting home watching the doctor. Watching Doctor Who